Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Hey, do you have an idea for a podcast but don't know where to start? Or do you have an already existing podcast that you want to take to the next level? Well, check out WeKnowPodcasting.com. From concept development to theme music to editing to logos, WeKnowPodcasting.com is a one-stop shop for all things pod. Don't hesitate to hit us up. We're very nice. We're here to entertain you. We'll sing your songs for good times, the best times, you can't go wrong. We'll two-step, a new step, it won't be long. When the Dixieland's are playing, soon you'll be swaying, so come on, sing along. Oh, and welcome back to another week, another episode of Before My Time. Today I am super excited because we do have another fantastic guest. We have the lovely Megan Meeker joining us today to talk none other than one of my favorite movies, Some Like It Hot. If you haven't seen it, pause this episode right now. Go sit down, watch the movie. I know you have time. Don't lie. I know you have all the time to do this. Watch the movie, then come back you will thank me. Well, there honestly doesn't need to be much more to say now because it is all said in this fun-filled, enthusiastic episode. So enjoy yourselves. I can't go on, Joe. I'm weak from hunger. I'm running a fever. I got a hole in my shoe. If you gave me a chance, we could be living like kings. You want to talk about it's about the Florida job? The Florida job? Get out of here. What kind of a band is it anyway? You got to be under 25. We could pass for that. You got to be blonde. We could dye our hair. And you got to be girls. We could. No, we could. I understand you're looking for a couple of girl musicians. <laughs> Okay, Megan, let's dive in to, I'm super excited about this topic because I had a list of things I wanted to talk about on this podcast that I'm obsessed with that were before my time. And not only Marilyn Monroe is on there because huge fan, like, but of every movie, this is my all time favorite movie she was a part of and probably favorite movie of maybe all times. Could not like agree with you anymore. Definitely her best film. And it is, it's got to be in my top five for sure. I don't know if I can say number one, but I, it, it might be competing for number one for sure. That's, yes. I feel like my top five like rotate. There's like 50 films that are in my top five. And And are they all mostly, you know, before your time? Yes, majority. (laughs) And they're mostly all comedies. Yes, yes. Like, I don't want to pick a favorite movie that I'm going to cry. Ew. No, I agreed. And a Billy Wilder comedy is just (sighs) chef's kiss of comedies. (laughs) Perfection. So where should we even dive in? Okay, let's, let's just get straight into the juicy of why you were attracted to this movie so much. But when were you first introduced to it? Oh, okay. You'll love this story. As a young, budding, bisexual woman, my grandfather had this huge poster in his basement bar of Marilyn Monroe in that like see-through dress. Oh yeah, that dress is... Oh my God. And I was like, oh, I was like, what is this? I don't know what I feel. I would like to watch this movie. What is it? And it was my grandfather's favorite movie. And he had that huge poster like from when the movie came out down in his basement bar and it intrigued me immediately. And I was like, whatever that is, I need to know. Um, I think it was like middle school, probably the first time I watched it. And just so freaking funny. And at, in middle school, like getting a middle middle schooler to sit down and watch a black and white film. Yeah. Like, no way. But I would watch it probably once a month and show it to everyone I knew who had never seen it. And it's become a big part of my life. Love it. I love it. I had a similar, I was quite young, actually, when I watched it. Might have been seven, seven or eight years old. 
And my mom owns a dance studio. I grew up as a dancer. And so I was doing a solo in the show to Diamonds Are Girl's Best Friend. And my dad was like, oh, I have to show you like where this comes from so you know. And dad being a dad, he messed up and got the films wrong. So, <laughs> so you didn't rented... get How to Marry a Millionaire. <laughs> no, it's Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Oh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Yes. Yep. We went down to the video store and had to get the VHS because that's <laughs> back when that was the good <laughs> yes, old days. I remember. I missed that. And he rented Some Like It Hot and was we were waiting for the song to come up. But then we sat down and watched it and it became, I was like, this is the greatest film I've ever seen. And I obviously dove into like a huge Marilyn Monroe love affair through my preteen years and high school years. But this movie just always stood and same. I, everyone I knew, I was like, you have to watch this film. It's gold. Yes. Also just like the Tony Curtis, Jack Lemon chemistry. She is fabulous, of course, in it, but their dedication to those characters may like makes the movie for me. And I'm sure you know, like in doing research and learning about it, how much they were really dedicated to doing it too. They're like, if we can't really actually look like women or be passable, we don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that- they actually went like because they were giving them like the old rack, like pick a dress, we'll just make it work. And Tony Curtis went to Billy Wilder and was like, no, we want the same designer that's doing all of Marilyn's costumes. Yes. We want them the highest quality. And if we're doing this, we're looking like better than her. Didn't they um, at the studio lot, didn't they like go into the women's restroom in their costumes during a costume fitting, right? To like mm-hmm. see if to they check could- it out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. To fix, they, they went in and fixed their makeup in the mirror and no one stopped. And they're like, okay, we've got it. And they say that they kind of did a little homage to that in the train when they go into the train first and fix themselves up after he tore a boob. Yeah. Oh, okay. Do we talk about that scene right away? Do we get into Let's- the epicness of that scene? And also I was talking to Scott, I was talking to my husband about some of the things that really make this movie a classic to me. And that Mm -hmm. is one of them. And it's it's not to diss on any movies that are paying homages to it now, but it's not like a white chicks. Like this is a very Mm -hmm. thoughtful moment of those intimate spaces that men can't be in and they don't interact with in women in this, in a way like that. And it's not, I mean, sure the sexy joke is there, but it's, it's also very smart that scene, how it's written and Mm -hmm. that Daphne is like really enjoying herself. And like having a blast and being one of the girls, which just makes that scene so fabulous. And it's like the clown car of all the girls coming in. <laughs> I mean, going back, what we because this is my favorite scene as well. I mean, I was trying to think what what my favorite, and it's it's the one I quote the most, but Jack Lemon's take, like you said, Daphne just immediately has so much fun, but it doesn't even take her that long. Like it's them the first time you see them dressed as women walking and you see, you know, Tony Curtis has that more put together. He plays the more conservative lady like Josephine. And and it doesn't take two steps for Jack Lemon to go one, two, and he's Daphne. And <laughs> yes. you can just almost see the smirk. And it's <laughs> and he has to convince himself and he does on the train that, you know, I'm a boy, I'm, I'm a, a boy. To, yeah, yeah. To, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, <laughs> trying to remind himself like throughout the film. And it's so so brilliantly done. And like you said, it's just so smart how they put these men into very intimate, small female spaces where they might not have this back, you know, behind the curtain look of to you get a bunch of girls together, what that looks like. And I think the train, the train scene and all the girls getting in to the bed, it's my absolute favorite. And he's just trying to be with sugar alone. And how quickly it turns into this party. And my favorite line, I think of the whole film. Well, I can't say that. It's not my favorite line, but I love when they're all bringing food and he goes, no crackers in bed. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's one of my, all like my sister and I say it all. If we don't like something, we always like, no crackers, no crackers in, bed. in bed. I Yes. And it's just, I mean, like, we, I feel like we also have to talk about the Daphne character in like trans representation mm-hmm. um, today. And I've read a couple articles about it and, you know, I, I think about, again, I reference white chicks or like a Mrs. Doubtfire or a Tootsie. Mm-hmm. And Daphne's character out of all of those, like actually kind of becomes a woman, right? And critics have looked at it in this lens of like, it could be a modern trans story that like, I figure out who I really am. And that, you know, it's supposed to be Josephine and Geraldine, right? And Jerry's like, no, I'm, I'm Daphne, you know, yeah. it, it's, he's got the personality. He's, he, he becomes it. And then, you know, we can talk about the end too, that I think is the brilliant, most brilliant part of the film, of course, but like he embodies her and he's very rarely out of that Daphne persona. Whereas we know, you know, 
Joe is going back and forth and being the millionaire and being himself and Mm -hmm. but Daphne is Daphne and that I I think is such a charming part of the film too yeah absolutely you know I've never even thought about that before that he does kind of switch to I'm Daphne and it's just it's almost like subconsciously that part of him to be her is coming out and was like has always been there and it's it's it is it's a finding yourself story where by the end he's excited he's engaged yes! and, like, and I just my favorite that tango scene that night is like the transition of you know him trying to come on we'll go on the boat it's romantic I'll throw up and it's yeah. just quickly just <laughs> trying to get out of it and it is it's it's such a great the ending is it's so ahead of its time. Yes. Really. And like you said, it's inspired so many, you know, whether this movie is the reason that we have a Tootsie and Mrs. Doubtfire or White Chicks, which I do think it is. It really, it was 1959 and it just, that kind of, it wasn't, you know, men dressed in drag in different stories and different reasons and ways before, you know, obviously in Shakespeare and growing up, that was always done that way, but not in this context. They actually, the ending was supposed to end with the line, we can't get married, you know, because I'm a boy and it was yep. going to end there. And they rewrote, and I'm sure you've seen this in your research too, that they kind of added in, well, nobody's perfect. And Billy Wilder, he actually didn't like that ending. He was like, oh, it's just so weak because it, it was too easy. It came yep. too easy and it seems like a cop out. But then when they screened it, it, it got such a great response because it is, it's the perfect Ambiguous, ending. ambiguous ending, right? Yeah. And wasn't the working title for a while, wasn't it Nobody's Perfect? I think there was Nobody's Perfect. There was, I think, Not Tonight, Josephine mm-hmm. was a working title. But it just shows you too like, how important and brilliant that ending is. That yes, it came too easy, but because it is the perfect open ended. You don't. What's going to happen to Daphne? Like, okay, sure, the traditional hero and heroine are riding off into the sunset, but then our non traditional ones are nobody's perfect. Are they going to get married? Like, you know, and truly, you're thinking about it being ahead of its time. In that, like, censors were very upset about this. I'm sure you've mm-hmm. seen that too. About they're like, oh my god, this is immoral. This is awful. Because yeah. it's just hinting at, you know, gender bending or heterosexual or homosexuality, you know, um, just, oh, it's not heteronormative. We're, we're in trouble. And to think about that people even that it made it past all that, that Billy Wilder even got to make it in that time is mm-hmm. incredible. And that's, I think, why, like, we feel connected to it because it felt modern still when we were kids. Yes, absolutely. It was even, you know, seeing it as a kid, it was kind of this even in the 90s. And for some people today, it might still feel very progressive because it's something that's obviously a lot more accepted and out now in our culture. It's still something that I think a lot of people do have a resistance to because there is the generation before us was resistant. And you know, you can feel that energy and it's fed to us when we're younger. Maybe, maybe not, but it's there. And so it, it's such a great... And Osgood, he's just one of my absolute favorite characters. I, I he know. might be my favorite. He's <laughs> just so accepting. And I love, yeah, he, just his Rolodex of wives he's had. And yeah. my mom doesn't approve. And <laughs> The mom feels like such a looming character, too, because of, like, you're waiting for her to pop up on the boat or something. And I just love that story. And also, like, okay, never worked with any of these women. Maybe that's why. That's part of that, like, open-ended, awesome ending. And yeah why it's still so timeless because a viewer now, you know, a teenager now might not even think of the things that, you know, we thought of as kids, like, oh, is that weird? You know, now in their world, it's like, oh yeah, okay. Well, they're going to end up together. That's the perfect ending. Mm -hmm. And it is kind of even going with like the traditional, non-traditional, even seeing our say traditional heterosexual romantic, you know, they go off. They're still kind of screwed. Like, it's not like she end up with the hero that's going to take her up in her arms, she's right back into her unhealthy pattern of men being a saxophonist that always leaves. (laughs) She's going to the the person that's really not good for her. And he's like, I'm not good for you. And he's done it to women before her. And it's, and they're going right back into an unhealthy. (laughs) He literally left one of those women in Chicago, you know, like I'll be back baby. And then he's going to come back with Marilyn Monroe. I come on. (laughs) <laughs> I know it's kind of I, it's it's great how it's not the perfect sunset now everyone has their white picket fence ending and it it's because it's more it's real yes and so that's another thing I think that settles that obviously we laugh we smile we love it but we connect because it is it's it's much more of a real life ending than what most of you know the fairy tale endings that we get told absolutely it's also just like a really surprising film because you think you know it starts out like a traditional 
like crime noir, mobster. Mm -hmm. You think you're watching a totally different movie. So maybe it got men in the theaters at that time and Marilyn Monroe. And then it turns into this like kind of cool moral lesson about nobody's perfect, being yourself, like being honest with people. Mm -hmm. Just so fabulous. So many layers of things we can learn from it. And still, you know, in our, our many watches, I'm still like still see and learn. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's definitely one of those movies that every time I watch it, there's something new, be it in that kind of like, Oh, I just learned a moral of life or (laughs) someone's facial expression that I'm like, Oh my God, that response was genius and I never caught it before. So we can kind of dive into the making of it back to the writing. And you're talking about, you know, the mobster movie. And, and that's something that Billy Wilder was trying to, um, it's based off of an older French movie from the thirties and then a German film redid it. And they were based more in the great depression and two musicians dress as women just to make a buck in a part of it. It's not the main story. So we wanted to do that, but it had to feel more life or death. He's like, there needs to be more urgency of why they need to dress as women and why they can't just go, Oh, screw it. Take the wig off. Hey, we're men. Like they have to stay in hiding so that they don't just raise the white flag with the girls. And it's a brilliant way. It kind of, he was thinking about the um, St. Valentine massacre and was like, what if we kind of make it based off of that? They see it and then they're running for their lives. So I think that was a genius way to pull in and then pull it into the twenties to give it that life or death urgency so that they can't on the train of cars going, God, there's girls, screw the money. Hey, we're men, let's do this. Like it's cause that also develops that urge. They have to resist as they are men, they are animalistic and they're on a train full of beautiful half-dressed women, which makes it funnier too. That's like where the comedy lies of that. Now they're having to, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, or I'm a girl, I'm a girl, mm-hmm. convince themselves, like, stop thinking that way. I have to be one it of them. It is life like, or death. Yeah. And I think, too, don't you think it it made it more acceptable at the time, too? It's like, oh, okay, well, if you were going to die, I guess it's okay. And so yes. now using it based just solely in comedy, like a white chick's big mama's house, kind of like, isn't mm-hmm. it funny that a man's in drag? It was like, okay, it's not as acceptable, but wouldn't you do it if you had to live? Yes, so which had- was very smart. It was a brilliant way to bring in a larger audience of acceptance for it that are like, okay, I'm, I'm down for this. I, I can understand, which is, I just love. So it was, he got Tony Curtis, but originally did you see that Frank Sinatra was up for Jack Lemons for Jack Lemons part. They wanted I did a bigger, not know that. they wanted a bigger name s- star. There's two stories and one will tell you one and the other will tell you the other, but supposedly Billy Wilder's version is, Oh, I really was just skeptical on if, you know, old blue eyes could pull it off and <laughs> in the magnitude of what we needed that part. Then other people are like, actually what happened is he went to lunch to go meet with Frank Sinatra to pitch it, talk about it. And he got stood up by Frank Sinatra <gasps> and he never showed up. So it's understandable why he would be like, oh, I didn't trust him because he wants to say they got stood up. But also I feel like that character, Sinatra was a misogynist, right? Like, I mean... Mm-hmm. It, well, he wouldn't have been right. Not at all. It would have been and- a completely different film without Jack Lemmon. I mean, he absolutely makes the film. 100%. And and yeah, as a kid, it was like that traditional storyline that I loved to follow. And that's that what I'm saying about watching it now. And like, the Daphne story is so fascinating to me and who his character really is or who she really is. You know, we don't, we mm-hmm. don't know. But so mm-hmm. yes, Sinatra would not be my choice. So I'm glad whatever happened, happened. Yeah. I think Wilder originally wanted Mitzi Gaynor for Sugar. He was kind of looking, Marilyn had written to him after Seven Year Itch and been like, I loved working with you. I'd love to work again. And and I I can't remember if it was the producers or the, the studio when they saw Marilyn was interested. They're like, get her. She's a big name. We need that. And by having her big name, that's when they could bring on Jack Lemmon as a you know, he still had a name, but not that kind of billboard and lights Marilyn. But it didn't go so well on set. I'm not surprised. She was notoriously hard to work with. So was Tony Curtis, though, right? He, on this film, had a couple stories of losing it, but understandably so. So she was notorious for being late, not showing up, not knowing her lines. But specifically during this film, this is one of the worst that she made. She took 40 takes I think it was 40 takes to get the line, it's me, sugar. Yep. I I was just going to say that I saw that. And it's like where she's got the bottle, like coming in that, in the door, two of the hotel room. the bourbon. Where's the bourbon? They had to tape tape in the words in the drawers. And there's a rumor that actually she says it when her back's to the camera. And it's questioned whether they even dubbed her line there. So when you said that, you know, it's like the dedication also that Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis brought, they had to be perfect on every single take because 
they would use the one take she got she right. Got it. Yep. And so they would do it 40 times. So they would always have to be ready and perfect because if that's the one take that she got right, that's what they would use. And Tony Curtis actually was really upset with a lot of his performance because he felt like the more they did it, the worse it got. I mean, obviously you're going to do something 40 times. You're going to start losing your fresh spark. Absolutely. Um, So there's some scenes that they had to use more footage of her because he wasn't happy with a certain scene, be it whatever it was. So it put a lot of stress on them and um, cost the production hundreds of thousands of dollars, days and days and days of wasted. You know, she would lock herself into the dressing room and not mm-hmm. come out, wouldn't show up, couldn't get her lines right. And so I know there are some stories of Tony Curtis losing it on the set because I, I get that. That's really, that's stressful and frustrating. That's your job. I And I have, I'm sure you will do a whole other episode on Marilyn at some point. Oh yeah. But there are those stories of, of that happening. And mm-hmm. then, you know, her team of those acting coaches, I can't think of their names at this exact moment. It was like the method acting coaches who basically controlled her life. Yeah. Uppers, downers, you know, constant to keep her working. And mm-hmm. I know that that's a, a hot topic of like, were they the ones that, cause these overdoses and these problems. I can only imagine working with her, but you know, from the outside looking in and also the money that they've made over time. Oh yeah. I probably one of the highest grossing films rented now purchased. Like it has to be. I'd I'd love to look that up. Yeah, I haven't seen the numbers actually. It's interesting because Billy Wilder did he had like a rap party almost or to celebrate dinner at his house and he didn't invite her. And because he's like you cost (laughs) this production, so much money, this, that, like, you're not welcome. She's quoted to have picked up the phone and told him to go F himself. (laughs) And he made a statement that it said his psychiatrist, his doctor, and his banker have all advised him to never work with her again because he actually got himself physically ill. He was so stressed making this project. But then years later, he's kind of revamped what he has said about her, you know, probably out of respect as well. But then, you know, it did end up being worth it. And he kind of expresses that, that it was worth it. Cause she did give a brilliant performance when she did <laughs> and could get the line out. It was great, but kind of not to dive too much into Marilyn, but I know right before this film, and I think why she, this was such a bad time for her was she was married to Arthur Miller at the time and they were pregnant and she lost her baby. So she was suffering from a miscarriage. I think it was twice tried to overdose on her bitch. It was bedridden for a long time, picked up heavy drinking, gained a bunch of weight. Yep. And she would sit actually to prepare for this film for weeks on end, didn't get out of bed. And that's when she would play her ukulele and taught herself how to play for the film. But she was just mentally in a very bad space leading up to it. And it's understandable. Then she gets on set and she was just... A hot mess. Yes. Well, and then wasn't she pregnant in the beginning of the filming too? I think she lost the baby like in, like during filming. In production. Okay, that might have, yeah, which that's something that also is like not talked about. Obviously, it's very common, but the stress and depression that that puts on a woman alone and now you're supposed to put on your sequins and look hot. Oh, like, yeah, and like, oh. the way that the studios treated women then too. Oh, I terrible. Mean, co- commodity, you have to show up for work. So I, if she had prioritized some mental health, if that had been a thing at this time. It, yes, it was not a thing. It's barely a thing now. I love exactly. that it's a thing now. It's great. I'm like, oh, this is such a great time to be alive. It's almost like too big of a fad. You know, I'm, we all are like, well, my therapist says, anytime I start my sentence that way, I'm like, oh God, I'm becoming one of those. But No, it's, it's great. It's, it's great. I'm so happy and excited that that's a thing because it's yeah you read these women's lives and it's just especially in showbiz and yeah like, oh, you, you think about the judy garlands you think uh, about these people that were like okay wake up here's a pill go to sleep here's a pill you are making us money you are uh, i mean that's all it was it's not you're not a human being so and her marriage to arthur miller just was awful and he was mm-hmm. abusive and a misogynist too and was mm-hmm. constantly thinking she was cheating and she might have been you know but I can't imagine trying to make such a big budget film with these big stars in that world and also having a bit of a mental breakdown after losing children and a marriage. And Mm -hmm. so I have sympathy on all sides here of like, she might not have been the most professional and why. And then Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon trying to be professional and Billy Wilder being such a hot um, commodity at the time too, as a director. So just lots of personalities coming together, but it made magic, right? Like it did <laughs> It really, I know it was just so it's such a great, there's a fun story about their costume fitting. I love that kind of still shows her spice and they were measuring the boys came out in their boxers and they had to take their measurements. And then Marilyn came out in like a blouse and, and panties and they measured her. The costume designer was like, 
Tony Curtis has a better ass than you do. And she turned around and unbuttoned her blouse and flashed him and said, but he doesn't have tits like these. And they all left. And I was like, that moments like that. It was like very well played. Yes. Oh my gosh. And that is like, it feels like the real her too. And so those little stories, mm-hmm. fabulous. And the costumes. Can we talk about the costumes? Can we talk about? So you <laughs> talked about the dress on the poster. That that was a very scandalous for the time. It still is actually a very revealing See through. That would dress be like- now. Like- a Bailey covering her nipples. Yes. Sp- talk about tits. Like. I know. And it was like backlit too. So it was basically sheer yes. in that scene. But it's so – because it's black and white, you almost can't tell <laughs> yes. what skin and what stress. And so it kind of works. And it's this, you know, just no support either. I mean, just tits hanging but beautifully kind of yeah. – stunning silhouette. It, it's the perfect dress, especially for that scene. Absolutely. When she's dancing and like the undulation, you're right, the dress and the way that the little tassels kind of like flicker in the lights and it's just so sexy. <laughs> it is. It's. I think it probably might be one of like the top, it has to be in the top 10 list of something. I would say top three sexiest dresses ever on screen. Hands down. Also, you know, you were talking about the men's outfits, their buttoned up persona, uh, the conservancy girls, you know, it, it just, I don't know where they got the clothes, right? Was it Tony Curtis's girlfriend was like, I'll give you some clothes, right? Is that how they kind of work it into the storyline is they take stuff from her? Is that in the beginning? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant in real life. Oh, like, no, no. In the storyline. Like, I like, think it was part of wardrobe. Um, yes. That would make sense. But like in yeah, the storyline. Yeah, he says, yeah, on the phone, he goes, we'll borrow some clothes from the girls in the chorus. Mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. So it's it's the girls that were dancing. It's Which I kind of, I always love stories like that when there's the classic like, oh, I'm going to punch that guard, knock him out, and I'll get in his uniform to sneak in somewhere. But it's the, Austin Powers does a really good job in the first one kind of making a joke of that when him and Vanessa are like, you take her, I'll take him when they're breaking into Dr. Evil's. And it's like the really, really tall, 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 thin guy that he goes after. And it's like the really, really short, heavy set woman that she goes after and they come out and their uniforms are perfectly fit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that happens so much in movies, which is obviously why they took a stab at it there. But I, I love when movies do that and just don't, you don't ask questions. It just, no. just it, go with it. It works. And they have just these great outfits that go with these conservancy girl button up attitudes. Just perfect. And then also like magically, you know, we've got stuff for, like beach being at the beach and like beautiful yeah, swimsuits like, how <laughs> it's I love and I just and even him stealing beanstalks suitcase and he's like my suitcase oh yeah, beanstalk I love, I love sweet sue and beanstalk are another ones that I love I I constantly think of her because I sometimes when I'm getting stressed I'll look at someone and be like I feel it and my ulcer's kicking up and, put, and she <laughs> and kind of just as you're nibbling on a Tums, like she, yeah, she has that rough, broad, you know, <laughs> girls, and they're such great characters. But I do, I love his. I kind of went from wardrobe to now characters, but we can do whatever we want. That's right, because this movie is awesome, and I do want to talk about the Beanstalk character and like how perfect and buttoned up that was too for Tony Curtis's character. That it was like, okay, he had nautical gear too, ready to go. And like well dressed nautical that he could pull off is Junior for Junior's millionaire persona. <laughs> this is also why, like, the writing is so fabulous. It's not there aren't these big plot holes. Like he didn't just come out in the suit. You thought about that. You thought mm-hmm. about how he named himself. You know, like Junior, the little boy runs by Shell Oil. He's looking at the shell. Like it's it's so beautifully shown, and you're not hit over the head with it. Yes, my I think along those lines too, I love how much they back reference like because they're all constantly lying. Like it, obviously they're lying as women and you know, we went to the uh, Shevorgan Conservatory <laughs> and then now he's lying as the millionaire and sees shells this that but then Marilyn as Sugar starts lying to make herself look fancier to this millionaire that she's and I love that she's using his lie of well I studied the Shaborgan conservatory and he catches it and they all just they're kind of just trying to fluffy because we do that too as humans absolutely we all talk ourselves up to make our I mean let's talk about the ultimate Instagram is that's what we do there we're like that's how great my life is (laughs) and absolutely and then I you know you think about that kind of became a movie trope didn't it of like see the shell, now shell oil, like here, junior, mm-hmm. like it became a movie trope. It became like a, an overused thing on like family guy type of jokes. And I wonder, not that this was the first time that ever happened, but it's such a well done, like see the shell, figure it out. Boom, boom, boom. And the storyline yeah. comes together without 
like somebody having to say it or have it be set up in dialogue that it's just you see it and then it becomes this great trope that we still see used as a joke now. Mm -hmm. That joke is being used and it's topical and going back to how classic this film is that a Mm -hmm. lot of these things are referenced in it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. And it's, I do think that like you said, there's just so many films today that that come off of this. And, and I love, I, this is a classic comedic thing is putting someone in a position where they don't belong. They're trying to, you know, bullshit their way through it. And, and him on the yacht trying to figure out where to go. And I do, I love that scene too. And he opens up the door thinking it's, oh, lots of closet space on this boat. Yeah. That's what's great. And just <laughs> is like trying to, I, I think it's just brilliant. Now, where do they set up my champagne? Oh yes, that's right. Thursdays. Like, just <laughs> And well, then you just, you spark something in me too about the the voice, right? The Cary Grant voice. The Cary He's, Grant invitation. Oh God. And I think I, I read something about him saying that like, you know, it, Cary Grant was upset about it for yeah, a second. He was. And then he was like, no, no, it's like an homage to you. It's, it's, it was good. It was good. It was because I love you. Like you are so classic, you know, and he had to save face a little bit for doing that awful, but fabulous impression of Cary Grant. Oh, it's Grant. great. And even I love when um, he gets called out on it. He's like, and where did you get that ridiculous accent? Nobody <laughs> talks like that. Like, <laughs> I love that. Cary Grant does. I for know. real. <laughs> It is just great. If anyone listening doesn't know that the hotel, they're supposed to be in Florida, but it's in San Diego at the California Dell, which it still is there and looks just like that. So it's, I love visiting Field trip, there. let's go. Yes, <laughs> for it. Just wear my little one-piece bathing suit and play yes. ball. Like, That's another thing. I love oh, the girls are all oh, like playing like yeah. games we played when we were six, seven years old, past the ball and they're, you know, what, in their 20s. I think Sugar's supposed to be 25. Yep. So, you know, Billy Wilder does some of those women scenes pretty well, but you're right. And that's where my suspension of disbelief kind of breaks, right? Like, would we go like passing on the ball around going like, oh, pass to you next. No, but you. maybe in the like, 20s we would. Who knows? Maybe, I, who knows? I've never been a woman in the 20s. So. I have to that. So it, it might have been the right game. But yeah. Daphne gets into oh, that I love, game. And I love when she, the ball goes out and Sugar goes to get it. And Sugar, honestly, because she's taking too long to get the ball back. It's just, yeah, see, this that brings my love for Daphne back too about mm-hmm. like really embodying that character. And of course, you know, the Tony Curtis character wasn't going to go out in a bathing suit. Like he wasn't, he wasn't embodying that character. Mm-hmm. You know, of course he was out trying to flirt with Marilyn Monroe in his junior character. But I also couldn't see Josephine going out in like playing ball with those, the women, no, right? No. Tony Curtis is a straight man, right? And da- Jack Lemon is always kind of the, the jokester. But mm-hmm. it's it's played so beautifully here because he is sincere. It's not like a joke. He's yeah. sincerely he, Daphne. Yes, yes. It's very true. And even, oh God, it's I love the bellhop, the young kid bellhop that keeps trying to... Oh, like, wow. And he pulls the like hat down, like, hey, baby. Yeah. Oh, well, well, he's going after uh, uh, Daphne. I mean, yeah. uh, Josephine. Josephine. He's like, I've got keys to all the rooms. Terrible rape joke. Terrible rape joke. Terrible. But- <laughs> he's like the sleaziest, most perverted, but I think they can get away with it because he's so young that it's like the young Comedic. kid that thinks he's got game. And you're like, get out of here, you little shithead. Like, yeah. <laughs> I've met kids like that, that they're, you know, thinking they're hot shit. I'm like, I am well beyond even 10 years older than you. Get out of here. Yes. So if it was like a grown man, yes, the joke might have fallen flat and especially over time been quite wrong. But yes. yeah, you're right. It still kind of works as in like you innocent kid, like that'll never happen. Mm-hmm. Also, if you try to get into my room, I am a very large man and I could kill you. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. God, even Daphne and Oswald's meet, you know, all the, I, I love the way they, the scene of all the millionaires lined up on, on their rocking chairs. Oh, Almost yes. Almost perfectly rocking in time, choreographed of the hit, you know, hat tip, prowling on all the, the new young <laughs> fresh meat coming into the hotel. It's just very, very well done. Each of those scenes too, it's, again, I'm I'm just so, when you think about Billy Wilder, it's not like over the, you're not getting bashed over the head with something. It's like a beautiful scene and he trusts the viewer to be smart enough to put two and two together and pick up the context of, it's not like, oh, hi, look over there, girls. Those are all the millionaires waiting to pick you up. You know, like you, you see it. And I feel like other comedies at the time 
weren't using the big screen in that way. They were still doing kind of TV small screen, like you got to set up the scene, kid. And totally. And, and Billy Wilder is so good at giving you those context clues, showing off, you know, again, even the scene with, you know, Italian Opera's Lover Association, all those things happening, you're not hit over the head. It's like subtle that they start coming in. Mm-hmm. The party itself with the cake, you know, everything happens and you are, as a viewer, left to be smart enough to figure out, mm-hmm. okay, this is bad. But no one's hitting you over the head with, oh God, we're going to die. This is bad. We better get out of here. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of all the the mobsters, we haven't even talked about that. So such a beautiful homage to all the gangster mobster films before. He did such a great job. Even when the the guy's flicking his coin, where'd you pick up that cheap trick? That was something that that actor actually was in Scarface in the thirties and he did that. And so it was kind of like a little stab of like, I didn't know oh, that. Ha, ha. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't awesome. either. I read that and I was like, that is so cool. And there was a couple with the mobsters, different things like that, that either they had the same name as a character they've played before in an old mob film. Fabulous. Or, yeah. So it's, it's like those, that attention to detail of really making it count. Cause with a, a lot of comedies, it's like you, you have to be almost more serious in a lot of avenues to be, make the comedy even more valid. It's like in a comedy, you kind of have to play scenes even more straight. Yes. And it makes it funnier. It's that idea. And so I just, oh, it did such a great, great job. And it's the chase scene in the hotel of them having to get away. And then they're in the wheelchair and he still has got the heels on. And, (laughs) you know, it's just brilliantly done. Also, like those scenes are so, like just the mobsters too are so funny. You know, you're talking about the, um, your quotes with your sister. My husband and I, our two favorites are, I want another cup of coffee. And also spats, no, you know, like, so we're always, (laughs) and they are so great. And like, it's these like caricatures of the mobsters. So yes. I love knowing I this is a genre that I don't know enough about, but I love knowing that there are little allusions and homages to those films. Cause of course there have to be, right? Mm-hmm. There's gotta be because there are tropes there of who these mobsters are and their characters. And it just makes it so much funnier. It does. Yes. It makes it so <laughs> I forgot about those lines. My favorite line, I think, of the mobsters is when they're checking into the hotel and they're checking into their event. And he's looking up, my golf clubs. What's this? <laughs> my machine. <laughs> Just so like, what? My God. I love his that voice. That guy, like, I love, yeah, the, like the big bodyguard guy. Yeah. Like, my golf clubs. My yeah. machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he takes off the, the the golf club cover and you're like, oh, it's all guns. It's a giant yeah, <laughs> Bag machine of gun. gun. See, like these little comedic things that you still watch and see that maybe as a kid you didn't pick up or mm-hmm. like you're seeing all these levels of of hilarity happening and each like character has their own and it's not hitting you over the head. I know I keep saying that, but it's it's it like is. subtle it's comedy. So eloquently done. I have to ask you what you think. So I'm Miss Jokes USA. Like I love puns, knock knock jokes, favorite. I am dying to know and I mad I'm sure I could Google it, what the setup to the punchline of don't worry about me, honey. I ride side saddle. <laughs> I'm de- like, I can kind of try to figure it out. And I'm just like, I got to oh. know this joke in entirety because it's the one legged jockey. I yes. can think, okay, the one legged jockey would obviously side saddle, but I'm like, it's a dirty joke. Cause yes. Sweet Sue's like, stop with your dirty jokes. These girls went to a conservatory. They're, yeah. they're proper oh, ladies. Like, and I want, I need to know. I'm going to look it up. I n- I need to know too. Cause I never thought about it. Cause I was, I always thought it was like an unjoke, you know, like where mm-hmm. you, where you're not supposed to get it, but you're right. It might be like a real, I need to know it. Dirty yeah. joke. Like, 50s dirty joke. Oh, yes. Let's Google. Let's figure that out. Your listeners need to know. Oh, yeah. Because it starts off the, has anyone heard about the girl tuba player who was stranded on a desert island with the one-legged jockey? And then all we get is, so the one-legged jockey says, so don't worry about me, baby. I ride side saddle. Oh, it's a blog. Someone asking, does anybody know? Oh, see, I think it's Everybody like, wants to know. What is I, the joke? <laughs> we'll have to write it because I think it was like an unjoke, you know? like a, Maybe, yeah. It's Ooh. like the joke is I'm missing so much context for this to make sense that it's funny. Like what could be in the middle of that? where she ends up getting on a horse somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So back, we're going to ping pong all around this to the fashion. There is that funny, and you'll notice almost all period pieces before, I want to say the nineties, I think we started getting more like, oh, we should be honest and true to styles of a period piece. And this is obviously set in the twenties, filmed in 1959. The costumes, yes. 
Marilyn's hair is just purely, she comes, when she first walks onto the train, which another killer outfit with the hat oh, with the feather going up and, and the this tight team coming past her oh, and so and like the feather trim on the it's oh I, I need that outfit yes Just putting that out there. Halloween the universe, costume need it um her hair is parted with kind of those more form to your face pin curls which would be more accurate to a 20s hairstyle and then she gets on the train and she's got a full 1950s Marilyn hairstyle and then almost for the rest of the film the dress that we talked about the super sheer that also is a much more 50s style it's you get definitely that funny you can tell it was filmed in the 50s stylistically versus being true to what the 20s would look like more authentically absolutely I feel like only the mobsters costumes really even allude to that style I feel like even in the beginning like I feel like they look like 50s musicians you know it's not even the mobsters are the only ones who kind of fit the bill absolutely yeah and it's it's funny I always felt that too and this is like a super side off but um dirty dancing which I never became the biggest fan of I I will say that out loud even growing up as a dancer there's just it never hit that chord for me but one thing that always bothered me is like babies straight up looks like it is 1985. Yeah, she is not in the Catskills. Her wardrobe, (laughs) her hair. I'm like, this is so annoying. Even the music though too. They, I mean, they picked some 50s music, but like it was all, there was like 80s hits in there. My mom had the soundtrack. Like, (laughs) Yeah, it just totally. And that's why I said, I feel like it wasn't until later that more films kind of got more like, okay, we're going to be more true to making this a time period piece. Because it's, yeah sometimes in the 70s 80s you can watch a film and it's like oh we're in the 30s and you're like but this was shot in the 70s I can tell you just they don't they kind of keep their whatever was going on in the decade and this film definitely has a lot of that absolutely in there and I think that some of like Daphne's outfits have that kind of right hemline and like waistline mm-hmm. like she's got like the you know the drop tunic over mm-hmm. the long skirt and but the hats it, are accurate they all kind of have the more I don't like call, they're not bucket hats but the like a cloche yes yeah, yeah. in that 20s and like that was there but um but yeah, it's I like did. it would be like comparing these to how in the 80s we were trying to emulate the 40s you know like Mm -hmm. I can see the inspiration in the costuming but you're right it is not it is a far cry from accurate yes (laughs) (laughs) yeah gosh you can't touch on everything on a film this fucking awesome I know I wonder too if we just like really get into the ambiguous ending and why it was so perfect um, as a good way to wrap up of like, I mean, we kind of did talk about that. I wonder if that would be weird to cut it and put it. <laughs> come back. I know. Yeah. Cause I was like, that's like what we started with. But it's so, I mean, that ending is the ending of the film is the most perfect ending. I think of any film I've ever seen. And I, you know, Billy Wilder was responsible for some of my favorite films. So I think about Sunset Boulevard, mm-hmm. The Apartment, Sabrina, original uh, Double Indemnity, which I took a photo. Oh, I love that movie. I oh my know. God. Barbara Stanwyck is like my spirit animal. Oh, just I. I'm and obsessed also with her. Talking about a classic film too, um, and people and people using that that storyline as a trope and remaking it a million and one mm-hmm. different ways too. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's but. such a good, okay. I do have a question that you kind of talked about it. I know when this film was introduced to you and I, I can clearly see why you love it, but what impact do you think this film has had on you in your life and becoming sculpting you to be the Megan that you are? Oh, I love that. Especially with the theme of your podcast, thinking about people who really do feel like they were born too late, not in their time. And I, I think this film, because it was so accessible uh, to me as a child, really opened up a world for me where I was like, oh, I can watch black and white films. Oh, I can get into old Hollywood because Mm -hmm. it's such an easy door to walk through and watch it and enjoy it and then be like, okay, I've got to see other things that these actors were in then. So then I'm watching other things with Marilyn Monroe. I'm watching more Odd Couple. I'm doing things Mm -hmm. to, to, to watch these actors in their element. So it definitely was an open door for me. It definitely was like gateway drug to <laughs> to classic film. That is very and, true. That's you a know, great way to put it. Yeah, it, it is. It's so easy. And then it also, I sold vintage clothes for a long time. And mm-hmm. the, the 50s clothing, one, it was like easy to acquire because unfortunately a lot of those women were passing away and leaving their full closets. In the positive note, I saved them. I cleaned them. I tried to preserve them and give them new life. So I think too- 
getting into this film and getting into fashion because of those iconic dresses we talked about. Mm -hmm. Me learning about that. I grew up in Kent, Ohio, and Kent has this incredible fashion museum on the, the grounds of Kent State University. So I go in and see these beautiful outfits from film from that time period in film. So I am not overstating when I do say that I think this was my foray into that world and like figuring it out. And again, I said it was hard to watch black and white movies as a kid just because Mm -hmm. you're like, well, I want all the color and the Disney. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Fast forward to the beginning of Wizard of Oz even. It's like, get to the part where there's red and blue. Exactly. And then so, but getting into the storyline and enjoying these characters so much, allowing me to open a whole new world and kind of mature to as a audience member, as someone who understands and wants to look back on the history of film in Hollywood uh, and how those studios were run and those movies were made and how did they make this thing? So really, absolutely, I attribute it to to my love of old movies and even I would say to, to fashion of the time and uh, stars of the time. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And I actually, yeah, I could av- agree with that. It, it was like the gateway to black and white. Yeah. Because once I realized how much I loved it and you could sit through it, you're like, oh, well, what else is out there? And yeah, and then diving deeper into all the different movies and, and CVs of every actor. And, we could yeah, do, we should do one on like Sabrina too. I mean, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. As long as we, we don't talk about the awful remake from the 90s. Was it, was it Richard Gere? It was, no, no, no. It's Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. But it is no Billy Wilder's should... Sabrina. Just the best. I know. I was like, I need, like, there's a whole, I wrote film noir down as a whole thing I want to dive into. But then it's like, do you just go with one movie? Because it's, you can't just, it's like being like, let's take on comedy. It's, yeah. you, <laughs> you know, it's like you have to kind of get more specific. And there's just too many great things to talk about. You might have to pi- find like one film noir actor to follow their career or director. That's what I was, yeah. One thread, course. one thread. That's hard. I know. And then who do you pick? Oh, there's just so much. Well, that's like this. You could follow out just like we did with our love for it. You could follow out threads from this with these actors, with the director, with the time, with the mm-hmm. studio. There's so many stories that that come off of this and also just what a big film it it was at the time. Yeah, huge. And we didn't even touch on the music, but oh, I, I know. <laughs> I just realized I was like, oh, you know, this could be my like maybe a nice little quick question. What's your favorite song from the film? Well, there's oh like my- three. Well, <laughs> Oh gosh, I well, I think about what's the one on the train with the ukulele? It's running just, wild. Yes, running wild, running free. Yes. Like just oh, it's so fun. And I remember like bopping around as a kid and being like, I want to be in this band. I don't have any skills, but I want to be in the background, like play the tambourine, like totally. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> it is. That's actually that is my favorite. Um, fun fact too. There was a couple like little goofs if you'd know better, but the film takes place, I believe, in 1929. And that song, and I think I Want to Be Loved by You, um, were actually songs released in 1930. So it's like a little like trivia, like, oh, ha ha, you didn't do that. But yeah, I love Running Wild. I love the lyrics. It's very relevant to me in my life of ain't got nobody to call my own. I'm running wild, lost control, like just and it's also, out doing it. You know, and when, when, I mean, it's like a sexy song kind of for that introduction of Marilyn of like, yeah. once she takes the coat off, once you see what's under there, once you kind of get a glimpse of her character, it's the perfect song to mm-hmm. encapsulate that character and who, who she is and her motivations too. It's like, just the perfect choice. I didn't realize it was not written for the film, so it is. It was not. No, it's it's very an actual, cool. Yeah, 1930 came out. You can, I think I have a recording of it somewhere. I'm gonna I'm find a it. recording of it now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that is a great place to wrap it up. We could again go off onto like little threads here, but gotta stop talking about it sometime. So yes, I'll pick now. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and talking about some like it hot. Oh, no problem. Everyone, if you've never seen this film, you better go out and get it right now. Find it on any streaming service. I think it's like $3.99 on Amazon Prime to rent. Do it or you should be ashamed. Agreed. Turn off all other devices in your home and actually sit down and watch this one because Mm -hmm. it is worthy of your full attention. Well, thank you so much, Gilsey. Absolutely. Fabulous. I'm going to level with you. We can't get married at all. Why not? Well... In the first place, I'm not a natural blonde. Uh-huh. Doesn't matter. I smoke. I smoke all the time. I don't care. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. I forgive you. I can never have children. We can adopt some. But you don't understand, Osgood. Uh, I'm a man. Well, 
Nobody's perfect. You know, Gelsey, I think it's really interesting that you kind of saw the movie by accident because yeah. this was a film that I actively seeked out. I was in high school and I was taking a class called Film is Lit where we would, <laughs> awesome. which in modern terms <laughs> seems know. like a much better name now. <laughs> Film is Lit. I'm we it. would watch the different movies. Every once in a while, she would be like right before a holiday. We don't have time to dive into a specific movie. So it was like, okay, I only have you for three days. I'm not going to make you watch half of a movie and then try to retain that while you're gone for Christmas and then right. like come back for the rest. So she would have like these like hour long or hour and a half long like TV specials okay. that she would have us watch. And the one time we were about to start talking about comedies. So she had us watch the AFI's 100 films, 100 laughs countdown, uh -huh. which is where this was first named the funniest movie of all time. I thought that it was absolutely hysterical. Most of the class was kids that were like, film is lit, easy A, like yeah. <laughs> just show yep. up and watch movies. <laughs> I remember literally that winter break, I went to Blockbuster and found a copy of it and watched it and just like completely fell in love with it. Yeah, because how could you um, not? Because <laughs> it is one of the funniest movies of all time. So here's my question for you. This is okay, our outro excited. question that I'm throwing to you. Love it. Are there any films in the last decade mm. that you think... A hundred years from now, do you think people will look at as like one of the undeniable funniest films of all time? You know, I don't know. I think there's there's so many that were great, but are so dated. My brain automatically goes to, and this is where it's just everything is so stylistic these days. Not saying they weren't as much, but I don't think it was so in these stylistic pockets of like, it might not be your sense of humor, but it's their sense of humor because the, it was all not invented yet when some like it hot in a way, you know, it's new styles of humor wasn't created. And so, you know, like my brain jumps to, you know, like Jim Carrey classics, be it the mask, dumb and dumber. Like, I think those are classics and timeless, but I know a lot of people that don't care for Jim Carrey. They're like, that's not my style. So that kind of also came to my mind that I'm like, well, uh, I think they will be funny in a hundred years. And I think so. I, I, honestly would have to sleep on that. I maybe could come back to you with that, but I don't have anything off the top of my head. Do you? The only stuff I could think of, and I'm thinking of it in the lens of Some Like It Hot. So the two that I came up with a hundred years from now, people are going to be watching that movie for the first time and feeling the same way yeah. was Shaun of the Dead. I think that yeah, Shaun of the Dead, Shaun like the Dead. I think that the pacing and the writing of that script is so strong that yeah. like, I could see that being something analyzed in film classes that mm -hmm. like kids are seeing it for the first time in a film class and being like, wow, that was really funny and kind of a weirder one because this one isn't nearly as popular as it was when it was first released. I think that it will get like a rediscovery. There's something about Mary. Yeah, I could see yeah, that. Because it's so subversive to the rom-com. See, my rom-com that to me is like the perfect rom-com that breaks every rule is Zach and Mary make a porno. I am so bummed that that movie did poorly because that was the direction I wanted to see Kevin Smith go in. It's so, it's such a good movie. It's so underrated. I think it's the funniest Seth Rogen movie. I think the line, the writing is amazing and anyone that's like oh really i don't think so and i ask them to watch it again they'll come back and they're like oh my god you were right like it's so good <laughs> i think forgetting sarah marshall will only get better in time yes i do agree I, that one is going to be pretty timeless i think super bad really i love super bad but i i'm a more question inquisitive there we go inquisitive about i, that I think and here's why i think super bad right. along with book smart i think that those two films are going to be looked at as almost like this package deal of seeing two different sides of the same coin. I haven't seen Booksmart. I haven't seen Booksmart you need yet. To, you need to see Booksmart. I, I'll add it to my list. I do need to watch it. Real quickly, let people know where they can go to keep in touch with us until the next episode. Until our next meeting. Yes, please check out our Instagram at beforemytime underscore podcast. Um, stay tuned there for little previews of next episode, what's to come, fun random things I'll post on the stories, and as always, DM us there. I will say, hey, say, hey, let's be friends. And you can also head over to our Facebook, which is a group Facebook. So also, share it all. We want to know. We want to see your weird quirks and things you're into that happen before your time.
And if you have any other things that you want to tell us and you don't feel comfortable sending it on Instagram or Facebook, you can email me at matt at geekscape.net and eventually we'll have an actual before my time email address. But until then, just send it to me and I will make sure that it gets into the hands of your lovely host, Gelsey Laurie. Father Matt, send them all the emails that are like, send this to 10 people or you're going to have bad luck and do that. No, don't do that. Please don't, please don't. Don't do that. Okay. Bye! Network. You're listening to the Geekscape Network.